topic is sort of self-explanatory, but I'll go over it uh, in a few slides uh, once again. So a uh, quick introduction, who's talking to you? Hi, I'm Lukas Stockner. I've been working on Blender and uh, Cycle specifically for 10 years now. It's, it's crazy how time flies. The first time I presented here, it said uh, for three years. So uh, yeah, it, it's, it's always good to be back and, to, and talk about technical stuff. Uh, some of the things I've done on Cycles, uh, too many to list by now. Some you might uh, recognize are like the new principal BSDF, uh, IES lights, UDIM texturing, uh, AOV passes, light portals, and uh, by now also many things that have been removed already again in the meantime. Uh, one of those is the original denoiser, which I added uh, in 2016 through the Google Summer of Code. So that's uh, obviously one of the, of the backgrounds for the presentation here. Uh, as of the beginning of this year, I'm also done with university. I did a master's in computational science and engineering. And the thesis topic there was denoising away adaptive sampling. So also relevant to this talk. And then the third point uh, is I'm also working part-time as an infrastructure engineer at uh, Genesis Cloud. So GPU cloud provider and uh, doing like uh, designing, building, operating these large GPU clusters you you kind of see if you look into the AI high market and this sort of thing. Uh, and so this talk compiles all three, which is pretty cool to me because, well, it brings together everything I do and I get to talk about it. So what is this talk even about? First, we start with a bit of uh, history of denoising. So what did people do originally? How did the field evolve over time? Obviously, this is something that a lot of people are putting a lot of research effort into because if you're a large studio and you have an entire render farm and you can just halve your sample count, that's a lot of money you're saving. Uh, then we talk about the state of the art there currently in the sort of production rendering and what Cycles uses uh, and what is going on in the research right now. And then specifically about the stuff that I've done over the last, uh, I would say, two years that I've been working on this now. Uh, the talk is going to be mostly high level, so you're not going to see math or code on the slides, but it's also not particularly artist friendly, I would say. It's mostly just a technical overview. All right, so let's get into it. Uh, first, just purely denoising before we get into any of the adaptive specialties. Uh, why even do we want to do this? Well, uh, modern rendering is all pretty much always based on Monte Carlo integration, and that's pretty cool because it lets us do physically accurate simulations and that sort of thing. But it has one massive downside, which is that if you want to half the error, you need four times the sample count. So if you want to go down to the level where you can't even see the noise anymore, that's going to be a lot of samples, like thousands, tens of thousands, and you don't want to wait that long for your image. So what can we do? Well, if you look at the typical image, the pixels are hardly independent. So if you have like just a basic white wall, then realistically the nearby pixels are going to be basically identical. So why not just average over them sort of and combine all this information? So you get, uh, you get rid of the noise. Uh, sounds easy, it's not that easy. Uh, but luckily denoising is uh, of course not something that's unique to image rendering. Uh, if you look at just classic cameras, you have your sensor noise. If you look at pretty much anything in signal processing, even beyond images, denoising is a very classic topic. And so there's a ton of research in it and a ton of methods for doing so. Uh, there's some classic filters like Gaussian blur, median blur, specifically get rid of uh, like so-called salt and pepper noise where you have strong highlights, uh, there's bilateral filtering, which is better at preserving detail, and that sort of thing. Initially, that's what people kind of did, but rendering has some unique advantages and it would be uh, very smart to take advantage of them. So what are those? The big one is feature passes. Uh, classically, if you look at the render output, you just get a nice image, but of course, there's a lot of internal additional data that we can expose. We can look at the albedo, so the surface reflectivity, textures, that sort of thing. We can look at surface normals, we can look at depth, we can look at shadowing, we can look at surface roughness, some people do that. And the advantage is that all of these are strongly correlated with the rendered output, but typically they are noise-free or at least a lot less noisy than, than the rendered images. They are not always noise-free. Uh, for example, if you have depth of field or motion blur, that's also going to land in your feature passes. And then you have the problem that this noise is also strongly correlated with the input. So we'll get into that uh, more later. But still, this is uh, very, very helpful information as you'll see in the next slide. Uh, another advantage we also have is we can split the image into components. So if you're using cycles, you're probably familiar with this diffuse glossy transmission, direct indirect color split that you can do. And that can also help you to process things individually and uh, preserve more details because typically different components have a different trade-off between the level of detail and the level of noise in them. 
But for practical applications, there are some problems with this, that it needs a ton of memory to save all of these passes. Some things cannot be split so easily, like what would a volume color pass even look like? So there are also reasons to, to not uh, go down this route and focus hard on this component splitting. So here's a quick example. Uh, this is a noisy image. A bit downsampled, so you can see the noise on the presentation, but it's, uh, of course, you can cheat and look in the corner at the credits, and then you can probably figure out what's shown in the scene. But uh, if you just look at the noise, it's very hard to make out what's happening here. But if I show you the normal pass, it suddenly gets a lot more obvious what's going on. And if I show you the albedo pass as well, you can probably figure out what the final image is kind of going to look like. And of course, so can the denoiser. So this is what we get, again, from this input, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. So. Uh, also, a quick uh, illustration just for these uh, component passes. So you see here we have uh, diffuse direct, indirect, glossy direct, indirect, and transmission indirect. And the thing is that uh, this case, for example, glossy direct has a lot of high frequency detail in it, but also not a lot of noise. So we can kind of just leave this as it is. Whereas this case, diffuse indirect is the main contributor of noise in this scene, but there's hardly any detail here. So we can just, could just really filter this away. and still preserve the glossy detail. So it would be nice, currently we don't use this, but potentially in the future, who knows. All right, so how do these uh, rendering specific denoises work? Uh, up to 2015, pretty much everybody was following the same sort of pattern or the same sort of approach, which is you select a family of filters. So you can say, I have different filter radius, I have different kernel types, like maybe Gaussian or Box or whatever you can apply the filters to different features. Uh, you can have different parameters for your filters. So you need some way to have like a whole family of filters you can apply. Then you apply all of them. You estimate the error that you get when filtering the image with them. Uh, there's typically a trade-off involved where if your filter is not aggressive enough, you still have noise, which is error. And if the filter is too aggressive, you end up with bias, which is also error. So usually there's a sweet spot somewhere in the middle which trades these off and then Based on this error estimate, you select the best filter and then you just kind of, for each pixel, select the best filter and merge, merge the result together. Uh, common choices for filters back then were uh, non-local means, which means that you look at a sort of neighborhood of pixels around the pixel you're considering and compare the entire neighborhood, which lets you uh, preserve features more nicely. There are bilateral filters uh, and there's uh, the classic Gaussian filter kernel. And you could also mix these together, like say use a Gaussian filter in the image domain and then apply a bilateral filter to some feature pass or something like that. Uh, common choice for this error estimation was the so-called uh, Stein's unbiased risk estimate. So if you read these old denoising papers, people always mention sure based, uh, that's, that's sure. Uh, the problem with this is that it is extremely noisy in itself. Uh, so you need uh, heavy filtering on this output to even begin to get a proper estimate of the error and you also need the filter to be differentiable, which is a large limit in practice. And you need a variance estimate for your rendered image. So you get to extend your renderer to do that. And it's kind of a pain. So people started to look into machine learning at this point to say, hey, can we just feed the image to a machine learning model? And it tells us which filter or which parameter to use. And that sort of worked, but well, we can do a lot better. So the first actual paper that I'm going to shout out here is adaptive rendering based on weighted local regression. Uh, this is from 2014, and they actually do something new, where the idea is that uh, they pretend that the image is sort of a mathematical function where the output is your pixel color and the input are the features. And then they perform a weighted least squares regression, so they sort of fit a linear function to, to this uh, data that they see where the data is neighboring pixels. And the weights for this fitting are based on uh, feature differences. So the idea is if a pixel shows something completely different, you don't account for it that much. And after you did this fit, you just evaluate for, it for the center pixel, and that gives you the color for this one pixel. There's some more logic that goes into this, like sometimes feature passes may be redundant. If you have a black and white texture, then RGMB is gonna be the same, of course. So you do like uh, truncated uh, singular value decomposition. But yeah, you, you just do that and it sort of works, but it's not perfect. So there's a follow-up paper, non-linearly weighted first-order regression for denoising Monte Carlo rendering. This is uh, N4, it's typically called, from 2016, uh, which uses the same approach, but they say, hey, it's kind of weird that we use the feature passes both as the dimension over which we do the regression and as the criteria for selecting the weights. So what they instead do is they apply a non-local means kernel to the color, 
and use how similar the rendered image is as a weight for this regression, which works a lot better. Another thing they do is they, when rendering, they split the samples into two. So you have an A image and a B image, which is half the samples in each. It's not as easy as it sounds if you use these uh, low discrepancy sample sequences like Sibol that we use in cycles, but there are ways to do it. And the advantage then is that you have two uncorrelated images. So then what you can do is you can denoise both of these independently, which makes it easier to estimate your error, which is what they do. And also, uh, you might remember that I said you have this problem that your feature passes are correlated to the rendered image. Well, you can avoid that if you use the feature pass of the B image for the color of the A image and vice versa. So this is this uh, cross filtering. And then after you have these two denoised outputs, you combine them, you do another denoising pass, and that's your final image. So this is uh, N4, this is pretty much the peak of, I would say, classical denoising before the AI took over and, uh, and everybody just went to machine learning in this field. Uh, you still see people comparing uh, the modern denoises to N4 in papers because, well, it's as good as it got back then. So you might remember this. This is uh, from, I don't even remember when exactly it was removed, but I think it was added in 2.79. So this is the classic cycles denoiser. Uh, it's based on N4, but strongly simplified. So we use, uh, uh, we used back then uh, albedo, normals, shadowing, and depth as feature passes. The only one that's not obvious here is uh, shadowing. What we did there is basically we computed how much direct light does this pixel get and how much direct light would it have received if it wasn't for occlusion. Then we sort of divide by that to get a factor between zero and one. The downside for this one is that it's uh, very, very noisy, unlike the other ones. So there I actually did this AB pass scheme and did a pretty extensive pre-filtering step to get rid of uh, the noise in this feature pass because with these classical ones, any noise in your feature pass will end up in your final image. Uh, but we did not do AB pass for the whole thing uh, for simply memory reasons. Back then we needed to store both the feature passes themselves and the variance. So you're already looking at like uh, 16 channels for all of this. Doing AB pass with the features would have been 32 channels per pixel and that starts to become a pain, especially for GPU rendering. Uh, we also did not do the second pass then because we did not do uh, A and B to begin with. We did not do this parameter selection with the mean square, mean square error. Instead, there was just this uh, strength uh, control which controlled the non-local means weighting. There was this feature strength which controlled this uh, truncated single value decomposition I mentioned earlier. So getting rid of irrelevant features was what this controlled. And of course, there was the radius which just controls how many pixel, how large is the pixel neighborhood that you look at. Uh, all, the feature, all the feature passes were pre-filtered based on the variance estimate and there was also a special outlier detection. And that sort of worked, but not that well, so we could do better. Uh, a big problem especially was uh, temporal denoising. If you did animations, it would flicker a lot. Um, working for tangent animation, I actually developed a temporal denoising version of that, which was in Blender for a long time, but nobody knew because it was uh, very well hidden away sort of behind a Python API. Because the problem was that the temp, we'll get more into this later, but the temporal denoising needed past and future frames. So you couldn't just do it once your fa frame was done rendering, but you had to render your entire sequence out to EXR and then call this denoiser. And we could never figure out how to do this in the user interface ne nicely, so we just never did. Uh, not great, but well, that's uh, how it was. Right, so uh, by now this is removed and we are now using open image denoise. This is a open source library from Intel for denoising rendered images. Uh, it's used in quite a few renders by now, I believe, but well, Cycles is one of them. Um, this is based on a neural network now. So it's no longer this classic filter approach, but it's just, we take a neural network, we train it to perform denoising, then we just use that. Uh, this is based on the so-called UNET architecture, which is a classic sort of in image processing. So this was originally developed for image segmentation in the medical applications, I believe, but it's used all over the place for, for image processing and machine learning now. Uh, so open image denoise on the one end has a training code, which is just everything implemented in Python using PyTorch. So would, you would use this to take your data set and train the model on this. The code for this is public. The data set isn't. You just get the pre-trained uh, weights from, from the repository. And then there's the library itself, which is written in C++, contains backends for Nowadays, a lot of hardware, so like uh, NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, of course, uh, Apple, I believe, and CPU, of course, and this sort of evaluates the model, and this is what you actually integrate into your rendering engine. 
Uh, nowadays, as I said, this is the default choice in cycles. So uh, I'm going to go more into these networks later on. So just to give a one minute summary of machine learning for image processing here. Uh, typically, in this context, people will always talk about tensors, and you might have heard uh, tensor cores and graphics cards and so on. A, a tensor in this context is not what the physicists mean by that, which makes physicists very angry. Uh, so instead, it's just a n-dimensional array. So typically, in the image processing, you have four-dimensional arrays. We can kind of ignore the first dimension because that's just used to process multiple images at a time for more parallelism. So ignore that, and then you have a 3D array left, and that's just with height, height uh, and channels. So fairly straightforward, what we're used to, just different terminology. And then the network itself is a graph of different operations which you perform in these tensors. So you have your inputs, you have your outputs, then you have a network in the middle which sort of processes this similar to, you can think of it similar to the node graphs in cycles, right? Or in Blender in general. And some of these operations have learnable parameters to them. Like you might be doing a convolution, and then you have your weights for the convolution kernel, and those, those can be learned or trained. And that sort of defines what the network even does. Uh, the operations that are relevant for us in this context here is uh, convolution. Uh, I would have loved to add an illustration here, but illustrating convolution is sort of tricky. So you're either familiar with it or you're not. Uh, essentially, you take this, this uh, kernel, you multiply it with the image at a particular spot, and then the output gives you your value for the, for the center value. And you sort of move this across the entire image and compute it for every pixel, and that gives you your output. Uh, so typically in the sensor context, you do not just have a 2D kernel, but you have, a, you have one that also applies across all the input channels. That gives you one output value. And then for each output channel, you have a different, uh, you have a different kernel. And so the number of parameters isn't even that high, but of course you apply it across the entire image, which is good because then we don't have to learn uh, billions of parameters. And also it's uh, location independent on the image and so on. Uh, another operation which has fancy name but is uh, really simple is the rectified linear unit which is just you clamp your value to zero at the minimum uh, this gives you this is a non-linear function which you need for theoretical reasons that i'm not going to go into uh, this is pretty much the easiest one you can get away with and it works just fine uh, then we need uh, downsampling and upsampling typically in image processing you have very fancy algorithms for this like cubic interpolation and so on here we stay very simple for downsampling we use the maximum of the four pixels and for upsampling, we just use nearest neighbor. Uh, going more fancy here does not actually improve the results, so this is good enough for us. And then we have uh, concatenation, which is the simplest one in the entire list. It's just we take two tensors of the same width and we sort of glue those channels together. So we get up output with more channels. Uh, I said we have all these learnable parameters. How do we train these? Uh, we to just initialize them to random values at the start, and then you perform a gradient descent optimization. So in practice, what does this mean? You load a data pair, which is an input and a reference output. You evaluate the network for the given input, which is your forward pass, it's called. Then you compare the output to your reference, and you compute a so-called loss function, which basically tells you how well did the network do. The lower, the better. This is your optimization target. And then you do a algorithm called backpropagation where you take your, your loss at the output and then you compute the, the differential of this loss with respect to each parameter in the model. So sort of how would the loss change if we change this parameter? And you do this from the back, from the output and you move towards the input, which is why this is called the backward step. Uh, and then once you have this, you apply some update logic to tweak each parameter so that hopefully the loss will improve. Uh, and then you do this again, you load the next input and you do this lots and lots and lots of times, which is why you need all of the compute power uh, for that. So what do these uh, networks look like? Um, on the left is the classic UNet as it was presented back then, 2015. So you see these blocks here are tensors, the number below is the channel size. And then uh, here, blue arrows are convolution and this uh, nonlinear operation at the end. Red is downsampling, green is upsampling, and gray just means copy. So you see here, we apply convolution to increase the channel size massively, apply another one. Then we downsample to half the resolution, convolute, downsample, convolute, and so on and so on. You see the image gets smaller, but the channels always get more until we're down here. And then we sort of do the opposite thing. We upsample and then reduce the sample count. Upsample, reduce. And an important thing here is we also 
have these skip connections where we take the original high resolution data and concatenate it here before doing this processing. Uh, we'll get in, in a second why this, why this matters. Uh, over here, this is uh, the open image denoise network. Uh, this picture is a bit old. This is copied out of my thesis. So this is before open image denoise 2.3. Nowadays, the model is a bit larger. So I think there's another layer and the channel numbers are no longer correct. So what it does is it takes the input image. It first applies uh, auto exposure to it to just bring it to a, to a known average intensity level. Then it uh, applies tone mapping to it because we have high dynamic range images here. So the values might get insane and the network doesn't like that. So you just map it to zero to one. Uh, then we take our feature passes, concatenate these together. We have RGB up here, just three channels. We have six feature passes in this case because we just use normal and albedo. And then we have our unit structure here, very much the same as over there with the only difference being that instead of the so-called strided convolution, which is a bit more complicated, we just do the basic upsampling here. Then we take the output, which again is uh, three channels, RGB. We undo the tone mapping, we undo the auto exposure, and that's our denoised image. So nothing fancy here, really just throw all of this in the network and say, hey, uh, figure this out. And it does, which is the magic of machine learning, I guess. Um, what is the advantage of this, this structure here with the, with the multiple levels? Well, basically, if you think about it, we want to use uh, data from a wide range over the image because the more pixels we can use, the lower our error will be. Uh, but the problem with the classical approaches is that then you need an insane radius, like a 21 by 21, which is going to be a lot of computation power. The nice thing with this is because we keep downsampling, the effective radius increases. So if you downsample five times here and then do a three by three filter, uh, downsampling five times is a 32x reduction. So effectively we are applying a filter over 96 by 96 pixel region without needing to process all of them. And the network by itself automatically learns that sort of the wide range details it handles on the lower level. level. And then over here, it gradually brings the details back in at the higher resolution. And this sort of multi-scale approach is what makes these units very powerful, and especially for denoising makes them the obvious choice. Right, so uh, with this, uh, this uh, state of the art, sort of what Cycles currently uses out of the way, uh, we look towards development. How can we improve this? Because if I remember correctly, the original structures from 2019, 2018-ish, so of course research uh, never slows, and we need to look at new papers, sort of what, what are people even doing. But before we just implement whatever is uh, new and shiny, we need to think about what sort of requirements are we looking at. So first of all, one thing you need to consider is interactive rendering versus offline rendering. If you have a live viewport, it should take milliseconds to denoise the frame because you want it to be live. Whereas if you're doing production rendering, then even denoising for a minute might very well be worth it if you get the, the ideal quality out of it. Uh, another factor that comes into this is later with the adaptive rendering, how often do we refresh? We just render on a render form, you don't care about the intermediate steps, you just care about the output. But if you hit F12, you want to see your image. So that's another thing that comes into play here. Uh, then it should be very easy to use. We would like to have no parameters. Uh, this was a problem with the old model where you just had to tweak it until it kind of looked right. With open image denoise, it's much nicer because it's just a checkbox. And specifically, it should be a safe default. So ideally, we shouldn't even need the checkbox or you shouldn't even need to think about it. You should just be able to leave it on and it should never make the quality worse and it should never have a lot of uh, like computational time or memory overhead. And also a big one, it should be applicable to a wide variety of scenes. So it should handle character animation, architecture, visualization, the VFX, even non-photorealistic rendering. Ideally, it should just be able to do everything because, well, that's uh, what cycles should also be able to do. Uh, then a big one that people often ignore is uh, maintainability and implementation complexity. It's very easy to build insanely complex models in PyTorch because it's just Python and everything is just predefined in PyTorch and you can just chain everything together. If you actually need to implement this in the inference code in C++ on like five different GPUs, on like five different uh, generations per GPU, which all need their own optimizations, this gets a lot more painful. So ideally try to keep it simple, try not to run with every new transformer block that people put in some paper, uh, check if it's, uh, if it's really needed. Uh, then of course, generalization to complex real world production scenes, uh, denoising something that's just a uh, basic scene with like diffuse shaders is very simple. If you have 
high dynamic range, fine detail, hair, glossy objects, all these sort of things, it gets, uh, gets a lot more challenging very quickly. And also a big one, model complexity. It's very easy to get nice numbers in your paper if you just throw 100 million parameters at everything, but that's the consideration, more complex model takes longer. It needs more memory, which is a very big one, because remember, we want to do this interactively, which means we want to do this while we also have the entire scene and the graphics card memory. So if we need 10 gigabytes just to denoise the image, that's not good. Uh, then data set requirements is a big one. Collecting good training data is hard. If you look at what all these generative AI people are doing, they're just scraping the entire internet. So that's a lot of data. So they kind of have that covered. But for us here, we need to actually have high quality scenes because we target uh, real world production. And we need to render it, which takes a lot of time because remember the reference needs to be noise free and you cannot just cheat, which some papers do and take one, uh, take off the shelf denoiser, denoise your noisy image, and then use that as the reference to train your own denoiser because then you will never be uh, better than your input or your original denoiser. So that's not good. Uh, and also a funny one that pretty much nobody considers somehow, disk usage. If you have 100 million parameters, that's 100 million numbers. So even if you use FP16 encoding, that's 200 megabytes and it will be basically incompressible. So if you then have five different models for different parameters, you're looking at a gigabyte in download size just for all these denoising weights. Already with open image denoise, which is a very, very small model in comparison to what people are doing in research, this makes up 20% of the Blender download. Uh, not on disk because there everything is uncompressed, but this is a big number and we should not just blow it up 10x because we can. Uh, right, so what are some of the new developments that, uh, that are going on in this area? There's a lot of it, way too much to list here. A lot of people are researching this because it's also something that you can pretty much easily get into if you're just doing like a PhD or something. Uh, you don't really need to be super deep into the, into the research there. Um, always remember when you read these papers, be critical. It is very easy to get good performance on synthetic data sets. As I said, collecting good data sets takes time. So what a lot of people do is they just take 10 scenes, then they write a script to place, uh, to procedurally place like teapots or floating cubes or something in the scene. Then they write a script to put uh, random light sources in the scene. They take 100 variants of each of those 10 scenes and they say, oh, that's good enough. That's my data set. I'm going to train on that. And for validation, I'm going to use uh, some specific shots of the same scenes. Yeah, of course, you're going to be very good at denoising that. But Good luck running that on an actual uh, animation movie. Um, it's very easy to undersell existing models in the name of fairness. So you will often see, oh, we took this model and then we retrained it on the same data set to be fair. Well, if your data set sucks, then the existing method is gonna suck. So of course your new method is gonna look better. Uh, that's something that people like to do. I don't want to imply that it's maliciously done. It might genuinely be in the goal of fairness, but it makes comparing things extremely hard. A uh, very big one is under training the models. So very commonly you will see, oh, we trained for 300,000 iterations and after that our model was much better than the open image denoise. Yeah, that's not really a surprise because when I train open image denoise, I give it 100 million iterations. So if you do like less than 1% of what a reproduction denoiser would do, of course your new one is going to be better because probably it just has more parameters so you can sort of just memorize the entire data set. Uh, one thing I saw there, for example, we will get to this later, the kernel-based denoisers. Uh, their big claim to fame is mostly that they converge much faster than these direct models like open image denoise, which is nice because it means that if you just give it a little bit of training, then it's going to look much better. But I found that if you just keep training and keep training, eventually the direct one comes back and it actually overtakes it after like 100 million iterations or something, which is crazy and it's good for us because it's much easier, but it's also a trap for people who just do this as research on like a single GPU to let it train for one night you're not gonna get a full picture. Uh, and also just not addressing all of the practical considerations, just considerations I just discussed is easy. Uh, nobody cares about the file size in the research papers, so you just throw parameters at it. Uh, so I went over, over the papers in the area, tried a lot of supposed big improvements. Generally, honestly, it doesn't do much. Like I tried these, uh, these GLU activation functions, I tried fancier optimizers like ADMW, I tried perceptual loss functions instead of the multi-scale structural symmetry that open image denoise uses. I tried neural pyramid denoising for this multi-scale recombination, layer normalization, batch normalization, residual blocks, blocks residual connections, depth-wise convolutions, stochastic weight averaging, all of these, if you Google them, you'll find thousand results. None of them do anything in this case. Uh, it might just be a case, honestly, that 
this model is too simple. If you think about it, there's a very direct one-to-one -one correlation between the input and the output. Typically, when people do things like image segmentation, the connection is much more abstract. But here we have this problem that it's really directly connected. So if you go to these strongly nonlinear, uh, strongly nonlinear activation functions, for example, the model needs to kind of learn how to compensate for that because we want the linear transform, whereas ReLU does that for us out of the box. So it's no surprise that ReLU does just as well as the more complex ones, or even better. So a lot of times, try to keep it simple, try to not throw the entire kitchen sink at the problem. Uh, there's also a lot of people, funnily enough, who come from the from the traditional side of things and don't really want to accept that this machine learning stuff works. So they always go, well, yeah, we can take this machine learning model and then use it to predict a parameter in our fancy theoretical model. Don't bother with the theoretical model, honestly. Just train the, just train the denoiser, it's gonna work. Uh, so proper training data in practice, I found, is much, much more important than throwing all the fancy features at it. Uh, but one thing that actually is generally interesting, uh, even though I just, uh, sort of criticized it as the kernel prediction denoising. So it's not as simple as just enable this and you get a 10x improvement, but it is generally the future, I think. Uh, what is going on here? Uh, one weakness that these direct prediction denoisers have is energy preservation and color shifts. Because the problem is, remember, we apply this tone mapping before we do it. So let's say we apply tone mapping, we just do a simple box average, and then we undo the tone mapping. That is not energy preserving because it compresses down your highlight, then averages in the non-linear non space and then undoes it, which is a problem. So the network must manually learn or explicitly learn how to account for that and how to make sure that the output brightness and output color sort of matches, which it does not do ideally. So especially at low sample counts, you often end up with significant color brightness shifts. I will show this in a second. Uh, Kernel-based filters, so the classic ones we discussed earlier, do not have this problem because if you apply this kernel, you can just normalize it. Then it's guaranteed that it will preserve your energy. So what if we combine the two? That's the idea in this kernel predicting convolutional networks for denoising Monte Carlo renderings paper, uh, where the idea is that instead of outputting the denoised image, you output a filter kernel for each pixel. So you have then like a 441 channel output, which is just 21 by 21 filter kernel, and you apply that to the original linear image without the tone mapping. And that way you can explicitly normalize your kernels, and that way you can guarantee that the energy is preserved, which is pretty cool. Uh, there's a follow-up to this denoising with kernel prediction and asymmetric loss functions, which introduces the idea to predict kernels at multiple scales, like this unit we showed earlier, apply them at different scales, and then merge the results together again with this logic that the fine details come from the higher resolution and so on and so on. So what does this look like? Well, here's, uh, here's what we had earlier and the yellow stuff is new. So instead of directly outputting RGB here, we output in this case, I had uh, 32 channels and here 64 and 96 for the other resolutions. We have this kernel block, which is down here, which just takes the input channels and scales them up to 441 channels. Then we do the softmax operation, which normalizes it. And then we apply this per pixel convolution. And then we take the outputs at three resolutions, we merge them together, and this is our final output. And note, we use the original linear image here, not the tone mapped one, which is why we get the energy preservation. So what does this look like? Here's a classic from uh, the Daily Dweebs uh, short. So this is one sample per pixel and denoised. This is with open image denoise. And you will see if I switch to the reference frame, the colors all over the place, especially skin tones, and uh, I think it's a dog, uh, are just way too green in the, in the denoised image. And for comparison, this is with kernel-based denoiser. So it's still not great. I mean, it's one sample of a pixel, what do you expect? But if you sort of look at it from, a, from further in the back or something, the color is gonna look a lot more accurate. The fine detail is still wrong, but at least it's not green. <laughs> so so that's, that's a big improvement. Uh, um, yeah, kernel prediction denoising, I think, uh, will, will come eventually. Right, so then, uh, so far, I've just said, yeah, open image denoise, they have the weights online. If you want to do research and development on this, of course, you need to train this yourself, or you need a way to do this. Uh, how do you do this? Part one, you're going to want some hardware. You can train this on a single GPU, but again, training it properly will take some time. 
This is where the third part of my introduction slide comes in because I happen to work in the GPU cloud with, where one of the advantages is you can just start GPU instances. So I just picked a node with eight H100 GPUs and uh, started playing around with it. Honestly, this sort of system is very overkill for this network because it has so few parameters that actually getting all the GPUs busy is very complex and starts to run into scaling issues. So usually I would just try four things at the same time and just use one or two GPUs for each. More important even than your raw compute power is your I.O. Because you're training on images here, so you're dumping like five gigabyte per second of compressed data just into this model. So you want an NVMe SSD on this thing, you want multiple ones ideally. Even if you have a network storage that can keep up with the bandwidth, the latency is gonna kill you. Because again, the GPUs are so fast and the model is so qu uh, slow that if it takes you a millisecond to load this data, you're already too late and your GPU is starving. So that's, that's a bit of a challenge. But it's a, it's a very nice challenge to have that your computer is so fast that you cannot keep up with loading. Uh, then you want the data set, of course. So for this, I ex extended cycles to generate a variance pass, an SPP sample per pixel pass for the adaptive experiments later on. I collected 72 blend files. I just used the demo files from the Blender website. I downloaded some from BlendSwap and from uh, Blender Kit also. I saw a presentation from them like 2022, I think, and was like, yeah, this is exactly what I need. So that was very nice, a lot of, lot of nice scenes there. I then set up different camera views, different lighting setups in them to generate 699, what I call uh, variations. And then I rendered each of those at nine different uniform sa uh, sample levels, so powers of two up to 256. Then I rendered it adaptively with six different uh, error thresholds. And then I also rendered with randomized SPP maps. So I just used Perlin noise to generate like random sample per pixel. The idea behind doing these random ones is that if you want to train the denoiser to handle adaptively sampled images, it's good to have that in your training image because if you only ever trained it on uniformly sampled images and then you expect it to denoise something that's adaptive, that's not gonna work. So that's something you need to pay attention to. And then of course you need the ref reference for which I used uh, 65,536 samples. That took quite a bit, as you can imagine. So in total, this ends up with 17,415 images. Each of those is rendered at 4K equivalent, so I kept the aspect ratio and just scaled accordingly. In total, this gives you five terabytes of OpenEXRs. This is already with half float, so it would be even worse with full float. Uh, rendering this took 3,500 GPU hours, 2,900 just for the reference frames. Again, uh, being able to just start this sort of thing for free is uh, very useful if you're doing this. Uh, and then, of course, for the training process, I did a lot of optimizations there. I changed the pre-processing to make the I.O. more efficient, changed the data loading. Uh, just, again, small things like, for example, copying the data to the GPU uses pinned memory, so the DMA is direct memory access for the GPU is more efficient. But this means that if you do this multi-threaded data loading, this is all written in Python, so multi-threading isn't a thing. So it uses multi-processing to, to distribute, to load all the data but then it needs to shuffle all of that into pinned memory and you cannot share pinned memory between processes. So what it does is it copies everything to a shared memory region in the main process and then that has one thread which mem copies everything into the pinned memory region. And this ended up being the bottleneck. Literally just the mem copy ended up being too slow on a machine with eight memory channels. That's crazy. That's, that's how fast these systems are and that's, that's why honestly you should use a smaller machine to do this sort of training. Right, so now we, can deno uh, now we can train our own denoiser, so what do we want it to do? Well, uh, the first thing that I wanted it to do and what I did in my thesis was denoising aware adaptive sampling. Uh, this is a topic that came up at uh, the cycles meeting at the conference two years ago, and Sebastian Herholz back then uh, heard me talk about this and said, hey, aren't you looking for a thesis topic for your university stuff? Uh, maybe just do that. So thanks for the suggestion, was, was a great idea and it worked out nicely. Uh, so what's going on here? First, adaptive sampling in general. It's a very old idea. Uh, literally, the very first path tracing paper, 1987, already brings up this idea of looking at the variance of each pixel and deciding where to allocate your compute resources. Traditionally, there's two ways to do this. You look at the variance estimate for each pixel, or you do this A-B buffer trick and compare the A and B buffer, and if they're close enough, it's probably gonna be fine. There's two problems with that. First, it's not particularly smart, so it can lead to some problems. For example, I have this here on the right is uh, no adaptive sampling, just high sample count. And what you see down here are fireflies from caustics in this image. It doesn't look like fireflies because this is at like 16,000 samples or whatever, but here it looks quite nice. But if you look at the adaptive seal sampled version, it looks much worse 
because what's happening here is that in some areas, the rendering progresses far enough without encountering a firefly that the, uh, that the adaptive sampler looks at it and says, well, there's no noise here. Everything is fine. We can just stop. And in other areas, it does encounter a firefly and it keeps going. And that's how you end up with these sort of splotchy artifacts, which is a problem. To, to the credit of cycles and the existing algorithm in there, this is a ridiculous scene. I had, to, I had to tweak this quite a bit to make it so visible, but it is a theoretical problem at least, and that annoys me. Uh, <laughs> and then the, se the second problem is this does not account for how well the denoiser will work in an area. So first we do the adaptive sampling and then we denoise. Why is that a problem? Well, let's look at an example. Here's the Blender 2.83 splash screen at a very low sample rate. And here's a visualization of the error. So this is a standard deviation relative to the pixel intensity. And if you look at it, it's, it sort of lines up. Like for example, here we have a lot of noise in this bright area up top and it's very bright here. Whereas for example, we have very little noise down here and yeah, this, this looks kind of good. So the estimate here makes sense. And usually this is what the adaptive sampling would focus on. So it would, play, would place a lot of samples up here, for example. So we can take this and we can denoise it. And if we now look at the error of the denoised image compared to the reference, it looks like this, which is a very different picture from what we saw before. So for example, up here where we previously would have put a lot of effort, there's no point because this is just a smooth area. So the denoiser works perfectly. Why should we put more samples here if we're gonna denoise anyways? So again, if we compare this, you can see the areas where you focus are very different. So the denoiser, for example, would focus down here at these reflections in the water. I don't have the reference image here, unfortunately, but if you actually switch to it, this is very wrong. It should look very different. You don't notice in the denoised image, but there should be way more detail here. So ideally, this is what our adaptive sampling should care about, not this. So how do we do this? Well, there's one paper for this, uh, Deep Adaptive Sampling for Low Sample Count Rendering uh, from 2018. The idea there is this is focused on real-time low sample count rendering. Uh, you render one sample uniformly, then you uh, let a neural network figure out a sampling map from that, and then you render three more samples adaptively, then you denoise and you're done. Because this is real-time, you only do four samples per pixel. You train the entire thing end-to-end, -end, so you, you have sort of the initial image, then you have your sampling network, then you have your renderer in the middle, and then you have your your denoiser at the end and you optimize for the final image quality. The problem is how do you do that? If, because you need to propagate your gradient through the renderer. That there are differentiable renders and so on and so on, but that's a very, very complex and different topic. So what they just do is they, ren uh, to do the forward pass, they render the image at different powers of two, and then they add these together. So for example, if you want a 10 sample per pixel image, you just take the eight and the two sample pixel, you add it up, you get your 10 samples. So this is the forward pass. For the backwards pass, they just use an approximate gradient where they say, eh, the image, the pixel is got probably gonna go towards the reference as we increase the samples. So just use that, it's good enough. This works reasonably well for low SPP rendering, but doesn't scale to higher SPP. So what can we do there? We can do deep adaptive sampling and reconstruction using analytic distributions, where the idea is that instead of pre-computing this SPP cascades, we randomly generate noisy images at runtime or at training time. So we say, uh, the, or they found that the random noise in rendering is fairly well approximated with a gamma distribution. And so you just compute the variance in your image and then you can sample, randomly generate uh, noisy images at runtime with random noise pattern every time for any given sample count you want because you know your square root over n converge, uh, one over square root of n convergence for Monte Carlo, so you can just do that. This is nice because you can also do this for 10,000 samples without needing the sample cascade all the way up to 10,000 samples, which would be a ton of data. And it also provides better generalization because every training pass, you're gonna have different noise pattern. The problem with this is that when I implemented this, it really didn't want to converge. So I ended up finding a more accurate gradient term. Now with that, it kind of converged, but still very poorly. I found that it tended to got stuck, get stuck on single images, uh, on single pixels. The problem there is that the softmax is a exponential mapping. So basically it took one training step, put a lot of effort into this one pixel, and then you had this problem the the grade, okay, it, it's very complex to go into the technical details, but basically the gradient sort of explodes on this one pixel and it gets stuck there and it can't recover. So I replaced the softmax with a soft plus, which approximates a linear function asymptotically, not exponential one, that solved this part. I tweaked the image loss term to prop propagate the gradients more robustly, that also kind of helped. 
So eventually I got this to work, but it really didn't work that well. And I couldn't figure out why. I spent two months on this. Eventually I just gave up. And it turns out there's a much easier approach. Uh, this is buried in this kernel prediction paper. There's just one paragraph somewhere that says, oh, this is how we do adaptive sampling, by the way. The idea is that instead of directly predicting your sample map, you predict the error that your denoised image is going to have. And then you use this information for this sort of classic style adaptive sampling where you look at the error and you guess, okay, how, much, how many samples am I going to need to make up for this error? So this assumes that if you increase the number of samples at one pixel, the denoised error at that pixel is also going to go down, but that's a fairly, re fairly reasonable assumption. And it's much easier to train because we know the true error. We can just compare the output to the reference and that's the error. We don't need to have all of this complicated sample maps and estimation and end-to-end -end and blah, blah. We can just optimize how close is the estimated error to the real error. Good enough. Uh, the bonus is because we get an error estimate, we can use this as a stopping criterion. So as a user, you can just say, I want my error to be below this, and then it renders until it hits that, and you don't need to guess what kind of sample count would be appropriate. So assuming that works, that is uh, very nice for the user experience. Uh, so what they do in this paper, they train a completely separate neural network to estimate this error. That works, but can we do better? Because remember, we want to save computation, we want to save model size. Turns out we can. Uh, how do we do this? Uh, first idea was, remember how the unit just has three channel output? Well, what if we add a fourth channel and that's our error estimate? Kind of works, but the problem there is then either we need uh, two models, one without adaptive sampling and one with it, or we need to always compute this error estimate even if we don't use adaptive sampling, which is a waste. Either way, so don't do that. And the problem here is that the training becomes unstable because early on the denoiser is very bad in the first few iterations, of course, because it starts randomly. So the error is very much a moving target. It keeps changing as the denoiser gets better. So the training is trying to chase. So the error predictor tries to predict the bad error at first, but then the error changes while it's learning it. So this, this does not work out well. Uh, turns out what works much better is to share this left half of the unit, which goes down in resolution, then copy the values and then have two different uh, parts to go back up. You can vary the channel count there and then you can just not use the second one if you don't want depth sampling and it works. Uh, this way you can first train the denoiser and then once it's working, you can add the second part and then tra train uh, both together. One important thing here is when you com compute this optimization target, the loss function, the loss function for the error part needs to be much, much weaker because otherwise you are in encouraging the denoiser to become worse, but more predictable. So if it always has a bad error, then it's very easy to just always predict bad error, and then otherwise the optimization would say, hey, that's ideal. You don't want that. So in practice, I used 1%, 99% uh, waiting for that. Uh, initially, this had a tendency to always just predict zero error because it was close enough, and then it got, got stuck there. That's not good. So I ended up using a asymmetric uh, loss function there. So if it underestimates the error, that's considered 10 times worse than overestimating it. This also makes this error estimation very conservative, which is good if you want to use it as a stopping criterion. So that fixed that part. So quickly, here's how it looks like. You see we just have these two stacked networks here, and this is just uh, using half the sample count here. And then we have one channel at the output. Right, uh, this significantly performs better than the more complex approach uh, before. So if you look at how many samples you need, this performs roughly 2.2 two time, times better than the non-adaptive approach. So you can get away with half the rendering time, which is pretty cool. The denoising itself is 20% slower, but honestly with the modern GPU implementation, it's so fast that it doesn't really matter anyways. And uh, if by comparison, what's interesting here, if you sample according to variance, it actually gets worse because I tested all of this at low sample counts and there the variance estimate itself is so noisy that it makes things worse, which is interesting. And with the sample map prediction that I discussed before, we get 1.4 times improvement. It's better than nothing, but 2.2 is obviously way nicer. Uh, turns out that if you first train this and then change your optimization to reuse the network for this, but then train it to do the sample map prediction, the sample map prediction gets better. It's 1.8 times, still not as good as what we have here, but it implies that it, uh, direct sample map prediction could be better. There's just some training problem which prevents it from reaching that state. Will be nice to figure that out eventually, but uh, no luck so far. Uh, I tested how far can you reduce the channel number there. Turns out that having half the channel number compared to the denoiser is the best trade-off there. Uh, 
if you train a separate network, instead of doing the sharing, you only get 2.0 performance increase. So sharing is uh, also nice for results. And training together also helps, otherwise you only get 2.0. Interestingly enough, training together, I previously said you need to take care that denoiser doesn't get worse. This actually improves the denoising result as well. 3% only, but hey, it's 3%, why not take it? So that's, that's very interesting, I found. And then one, one interesting idea is, uh, do we even need a neural network for this? There's an uh, alternative approach, denoising aware bit of sampling from Monte Carlo ray tracing from 2013, where the idea is that they throw theory at the whole thing and they look at how does variance propagate through a denoiser? So if we know the variance of the input, can we estimate the variance of the output? Turns out you can with a somewhat obscure mathematical operation known as the Jacobian vector product. Uh, to be exact, you, you take a variance input, you randomly flip signs on it, then you put it through this Jacobian vector product, and then the expected value of the output is your error. But it's only the expected value, so ideally you do this a few times and you average it together. Uh, that works as they show in their paper, but there's two problems with it. First, uh, the Jacobian vector product is a fairly obscure operation, so PyTorch and so on implement this, but it's usually very slow. And of course, we would need it in the open image denoise inferring code eventually, so have fun implementing that. So uh, that's what I did. Uh, there's this paper, Forced Jacobian Vector Product for Deep Networks, which shows how to do this for certain types of networks, which are what we use here, luckily. Turns out you, this reduces to basically processing multiple batches at the same time. You need some changes in your downsampling code, but the convolution, which is the complex part, can stay the same. That works, but not that well. So if we do this, this random computation that I said with just one time, we get a 1.57 uh, reduction in needed samples, not even close to the 2.2 that we had before. If we do it with four copies, we get 1.68, still not close. And now we are doing the image itself and four random copies, so it's five times the computation compared to the 20% more computation we had before, so never mind. Right, so, so far all the tests I've done were just in PyTorch and using this fake renderer to generate noisy images. How does it actually uh, work in cycles? Um, direct error prediction clearly is the best candidate, so why not implement that? Most of the open image denoise code can be reused as is because, again, it's the same network, just different channel count. We just need a copy tensor operation because the code is very smart and does a lot of the operations in place. But because we use these skip connections for both networks, we need to copy them, so implement that. We need a post-process error operation, which does uh, the normalization and does not undo the tone mapping like it does for the color. And then cycles just gives the open image denoise library a buffer, says, hey, please put the error here, and it does it. So very, very nice and clean implementation there. So then I modified this adaptive sampling in cycles to use this error estimate. Initially, I just looked at the error estimate and said, okay, if it's lower than a threshold, we stop. That's not ideal. So what's better is you look at the error, you compute how many samples am I probably gonna need, and then you look, is the sample that I'm about to render above this? If it is, then you stop. It's not trivial because of GPU parallelism. We might do several sec samples at the same time. So in practice, you do a atomic uh, fetch and increment on your sample counter, then you compare that to your target, and if it's above, you say, okay, never mind, do atomic decrement on the sample counter, and then everything works. So how does this look like? Here's an example scene. Here you can see the relative error, so a lot of it in the dark areas. Uh, here's the image again, and here's what the classic adaptive sampling in cycles does. So you can see it does pretty well. It mostly focuses on the areas where you see a lot of noise. So up here is very noisy, and especially up here and in this area. So here it focuses a lot of work, so that's nice. But what about denoising? Well, with the new approach, it looks like this, which is very different. But if you think about it, it makes sense, because for example, let's look at the area down here. Here it puts a lot of effort in. Here it really doesn't. But if you look at the image, this is extremely smooth. There's no reason to put more work here. The denoiser is gonna do just fine. Whereas if you look at all the errors that need a lot of effort here, like for example this, if you look at the image, there's a lot of fine detail in the reflection here. And in the reflection, there's no feature pass that can help us. So it makes sense to focus more work here. So works fairly nicely. Uh, different example, barbershop scene. Um, at a high error threshold, the sample map is like this. So most of it is pretty fine and it focuses really on the worst offenders here on the, on the specular reflections. And as we increase, or as we decrease the error threshold that we're willing to accept, it ends up putting more and more effort into it. But still, even at this really low threshold, it really just doesn't care about the ceiling because it can denoise it, why care? 
And then finally, for this uh, sample map thingy that I mentioned with the atomics and so on, uh, here's the sample scene. Here's what it looks like before. And you can see this sort of like tree ring structure here because that's always, it does a passive denoising, then it gets a new error mess estimate, and then it realizes, oh, I'm already under it, never mind. So, which is why you have these discrete layers here. And with the better approach, it looks like this. So no more discrete layers. And at first glance, you might think, oh, it's doing more computation. But actually, I don't have the numbers in the slide, unfortunately. But this is both better quality and faster. So that's nice. We'll take it. And here's a quick, uh, quick graph just showing uniform and adaptive sampling. Uh, quality, higher is better. So you see pretty much the same quality in half the time, or just at any given time, better quality. So that's quite nice. And then very quickly, because I see that I'm running out of time, um, temporal denoising. Uh, why do that? You have your flickering and animations. Uh, what's going on here? Denoising is more effective at higher frequencies than at lower frequencies. Uh, kind of makes sense because it's a high pass filter. The, prob the slow frequency noise is not really a problem in still images, but if our frames are uncorrelated, it's going to be very different across frames and then you see it as flickering. So it's not noticeable in the spatial domain, but it is noticeable in temporal domain. How do we get around this? Well, we can just try to reduce the low frequency error. So one thing you can do is re reuse the same seed between different frames, because then it's not uncorrelated anymore, but that doesn't work always, so it's not a silver bullet. There's this blue noise sampling that I added a few months ago that pushes error towards higher frequencies where the denoising is more effective, but also not ideal and does not solve everything. And there's this kernel prediction denoising, which inherently has less color shifts and brightness changes but also does not solve everything. So we really need to address this properly. How do we do that? We combine information from multiple frames. On the one hand, this just gives a better output in general because more input data. And on the other hand, it allows it to account for neighboring frames. There's two approaches to do this. You can do this multi-frame, what I call it, where you take previous and potentially next frames and feed them together. Uh, the problem with this is if you're using future frames, you need to do it as a separate step. Or if you're doing a render form where each node does a different frame, which makes it a pain for pipeline work. But this is usually used for high quality rendering. And then there's this recurrent approach, which is used for interactive rendering, where the idea is that you remember some information from the previous frame and then reuse it for the next one. Again, there's very complex recurrent networks, but there's a very simple approach, uh, which I'll just show you in a second. So how do we do this? What's the current state there? Well, we need to build a data set again, this time with animated shots. I started with uh, open movie shots. Uh, I ended up also taking my previous scenes and manually animating them to create these camera fly arounds and stuff like that, typically aiming for like 20 frames. You don't want it to be too long because you want variety, but you also want it to not to be too short because remember, we need these neighbors. So if we only have two animated frames, you can't look at the five frame neighborhood. Uh, currently, I don't have nearly enough scenes. I need way more. So that's a to-do. Uh, then I extended open image denoise to be able to load and preprocess these. I extended it to do so-called motion warping, where the idea is that you look at the vector pass, which tells you where a pixel moved between two frames, and you sort of warp the old image to align with the new one. That way, the denoiser has an easier time figuring out, like following the motion of an object, for example, which helps for denoising. The problem there is right now, Cycles does not support generating the vector pass if you enable motion blur, because traditionally, this pass was used to fake motion blur. So if you're doing the real one, why would you need it? Well, for this, so that's a to-do to implement that. And so there's one approach that I'm looking at, which is a basic recurrent, I call it. There you just take the output of the previous frame, the denoised output, you apply the motion warping to the next frame, and then you feed that as a feature pass into your unit. The unit itself doesn't change, it just gets three more channel inputs. And then you train this with so-called backpropagation through time. So I treat this as a big network where we have four copies of the same denoiser, and then we have these warp operations in the middle. And then for each of it, we estimate the difference and combine it this all to make sure the denoiser itself still works. And then we also look at the temporal gradient between frames. It's not in here because this would just get a mess otherwise, but that's how it works. Uh, problem with this is training this in practice. Okay, I'm gonna skip over this for time reasons, but it is very tricky to train this uh, on these big systems. It gets even harder. You have even more performance problems. So. Don't use such big systems. Uh, current state is the training works. If I, if I plot the temporal gradient, it's performing much better than not doing it. But I don't have the inference code yet, so I can't show it to you yet. And it might just be, might just be coincidence that the numbers look better. So no guarantees yet. 
And because the data set is so small, I'm seeing overfitting problems, so I need, I need more scenes there. Uh, second approach is do this multi-frame thing, look at past and future frames, motion warp all of them, and then feed all of them in as a feature pass. So then we have like 30 features going into the uh, network and then just do standard unit. Benefit, you don't need this complex recurrent training, but downside is you have much more I.O. requirements, much more data, much more memory requirements, and so on. And then finally, there's uh, the fancy multi-frame. This is what they do in this KPCN paper as well. The idea there is you take all of your neighboring frames, you apply the same network to each individually, to, uh, so you apply a unit, a complex one, to get sort of intermediate outputs, then you motion warp the intermediate outputs, and then you have a network that predicts your filter kernel across all the frames. And then you just apply that. The neat thing about this is that the complex part, this intermediate feature extractor, can be reused for single frames. You just need a different kernel predictor there. So we save networks, we save uh, download size, and so on and so on. Downside, very complex to implement, especially on the inference side. Both of these, I have some code, but no training yet, so who knows how well they will work. Uh, right, so conclusion. Uh, I went over a lot of stuff. Uh, what's the current status with all of this? Um, the adaptive sampling works. I have code for this on my Project Blender org uh, page. Um, after the master's thesis, I decided to take a break from it because honestly, I was sick of it after five months of just working on it nonstop. You may remember uh, last year, if you've met me at a conference, I was always sitting on my laptop trying to get this to work. So. Uh, as usual, uh, very much a rush to get this done last minute, but I want to pick it up eventually again. So what's the future work here? Uh, we need to improve the temporal data set. It's clear that it's not good enough. We need, to, we need more data, or I need more data. I need more scenes. I need to render much more. I need five terabytes is not enough, you know? Uh, we, or I, need to coordinate with the upstream open image uh, denoise development to make sure that we're not duplicating effort here. Already work in progress, already already writing emails there. So of course the goal is that this should not just be in Blender, but this should be available to every open image user. Uh, pick back up the adaptive sampling work, try to upstream it, try to polish it. Uh, work on the improvements on the cycle side. So I mentioned we need the vector pass with motion blur. Uh, look into yet other advances in neural network design, like depth-wise separable convolution kernels. Those might generally be promising. So that's uh, that's something I will keep doing because I have the luxury of being able to just try a hundred different things on this, on this uh, GPU server, so why not do it? And also a big one, publish the data set that I'm using. I complained earlier, a lot of the researchers just use these crappy synthetic data sets. Well, I can't really blame them because they don't have the re render power and the availability of the scenes to do it properly, but I've already done it, so why not just publish all of this? Well, the practical answer is it's five terabyte, where are you gonna host, host that? But there are approaches to doing this, so that's something I'm very much looking into. And yeah, a lot of exciting stuff ahead. Uh, my last slide would say questions, but if I look at the time, I should very much stop. <laughs> so yeah, just if this sounds interesting to you, if you want the source code, if you want the papers, if you want any more info, if you want the data set, send me an email, talk to me on chat. I'm very much down to talk to anyone who also is interested about this. So thanks a lot for your attention.